Oh, man. Are you glad you came to church? I am so thankful to be here. It's going to be a fun day. Um, man, can you give it up for our worship team as well and tell them thanks for leading us? Super awesome. I feel the energy in the room. It feels really good in here. And uh, man, what a great day it is. The weather's perfect outside. And uh, man, God is here. Amen. Uh, I'm excited about sharing this morning uh, with you. If you're a first time guest, can we just tell you welcome? If you're a first time guest, would you just raise a hand? We're not going to make you do anything crazy, but thank you for coming. Man, we're praying that, uh, that, you've, that you're blessed this morning and uh, that you, that you uh, find a church home. So uh, we're excited that, that God is moving and shaking in Renew Life Church, and he's doing a lot of things, and it's, it's been a blast. But some time ago, I want to dive into this, but some time ago, uh, the Lord started talking to me. It was actually uh, January of 2023. Uh, he started talking to me about lines of demarcation. And uh, honestly, I had to go to Google. I was like, what does the Google machine have to say about lines of demarcation? Because this coding machine has no idea what the Lord's talking about. And so I was on the front row and I'm just over there during worship, just Googling and put it in my notes. And, and I feel like the Lord brought it back up to me uh, this, this just yesterday morning as I was thinking about today and just what, what direction we needed to go. But uh, a line of demarcation is very simply a line that divides. It's a line that divides. And there's probably someone in the room that's smarter than me and you have a different definition and I'm okay with that, but we can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, a, it's a line that divides and in a line that divides, it could be uh, a country's border, right? Uh, that divides one country from another. Uh, it could be a river or, or, or a massive uh, like um, um, geographical uh, thing on a map that actually causes division between two separate, separate areas. You can think about the Red River. It separates Texas and Oklahoma. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really bad joke to say earlier. I took it out of my notes because it was like, I probably shouldn't say that in church. Uh, it was about the Oklahoma Sooners and so. <sighs> I'm going to love you well today. I was thinking about Matt, and I was thinking about Isaac, and I'm like, oh, this is perfect for them. And so, but the Lord won me years ago, and so I'm going to return love. So, <laughs> but it, lines of demarcation um, are, are, are kind of all over the place. And when I heard this phrase in my spirit, I knew that he wasn't talking about uh, geographical things on a map or between countries or different things or cities or states, whatever. I knew that he was talking about people choosing between one of two things. It was like he was drawing a line and on this side was something and on this side was the other. And uh, I was thinking about Matthew chapter six. And in Matthew chapter six, uh, Jesus tells us that no man can serve two masters. You may have remembered this. Now he says that for either you will love one and hate the other, or you'll be loyal to one and you'll despise the other. He says this, you, you can't actually serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the spirit that hovers over the materialistic things of the world. He says you're either going to be uh, one that, that places all your trust in that and you'll remove trust in me and you'll put trust in something that actually can't satisfy, that actually is going to burn, as Robert Moore says. <laughs> it's all going to burn. Uh, but he says you can't serve God and you can't serve me. Uh, you can't serve God and mammon all at the same time. And there's this line of demarcation that the Lord kind of draws, like it's either this or it's that. Uh, how many of you uh, in the room brought your Bible to church? Brought your Bible? Raise, raise your Bible up. Let's see all these Bibles. Come on, look at all these Bibles. Give it up for yourselves real fast. Way to go. If you didn't bring your actual Bible and you have your digital Bible, you can raise that one too. We'll accept you today. Amen. Give it up for yourselves too. You charged your Bible this morning. I was so happy. I was on the charger all night long. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I want you to go to, Luke, uh, to John chapter 8, if you have your Bible. You can flip that open to the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John chapter 8. This is a familiar uh, story in Scripture for those that may have been around church for some time. John chapter 8, I'm going to read out of uh, verses 1 through 11 says this, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people were gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. 
The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded such, uh, us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? So they're drawing a line in this moment, the, the re- le- religious leaders of the day. Verse six, he says, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis to accuse him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until it was only Jesus left with a woman standing there in his midst. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Instantly in this moment, uh, this is obviously humiliating. Imagine a room like this where Jesus appeared on uh, in, 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 in the room and started sharing and then all of a sudden through those doors uh, some people bust through and they've caught this woman in the act of adultery and they, they throw her right in front and center and they're like, Jesus, they stop everything. Jesus, this is what she's done but this is what the law says. The law says that we should be able to throw stones at her until she dies. What do you have to say? They're instantly drawing this line that, that they're wanting to make Jesus choose one or the other. He stoops down in the dirt as this is happening, and he he writes something in the dirt, and then he says this in verse seven, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he goes back into the dirt and he begins to write something again. I don't know what he was writing, but I like to think that he was writing something that sounded like, I'm your huckleberry. (laughs) That'd be fantastic. Like, that's the Jesus that I serve. (laughs) Say when, like he's that. He's that Jesus. He's the one that fashioned whips and just started driving people out. I would imagine at one point he was like, say when, you know? So that's just the Jesus that I think about. Anyways, he's, he is a lion and he is a lamb. But Jesus makes this statement and he says, okay, if you, if you are so holy and you're without sin, you start throwing stones first. Instantly, this completely shifts everything and he puts the people that were accusing the woman, he now puts them on trial. Okay, so since you're so holy, let me draw a line for you. And if you are so pure that you can throw a rock, step on this side of the line, and if you are not, then walk away. And they slowly but surely, starting with the oldest to the last, they begin to walk away. And Jesus draws this line in the sand, so to speak. Maybe he drew an actual line, I don't know. But because of their sin, and they were convicted by their conscience, they began to walk away. They stepped out of their place of, of accusation in this moment. And Jesus, he shot holes with one comment, with one phrase. He shot holes in their whole argument. On one side of this line, there was Jesus who says, has no one condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. He says, now go and leave your life of sin. On the side of the line that Jesus is on, there is no condemnation. On the side of the line that Jesus was on, what she didn't hear was a man who had authority tell her that she is something wrong, like the ones that were on the other side of the line that represented the law saying that she is something wrong because of what she did. Can I tell you that Jesus in his grace doesn't condemn you, but it condemns your sin? Because he separated that in this moment. He says, neither do I condemn you, but then what did he say? Leave your life of sin. On this side of the line was the grace of God, and on that side of the line was because of what you've done, you now have to pay for what you've done. And Jesus says, no, I actually am paying for everything for this woman. I don't condemn her, and I'm actually gonna let her go free. Grace says that you did something wrong. The law wants to hold you to that thing so that you become the wrong thing that you did. And I think that some of us in this room are holding ourselves in an unfair place. We, are, we might have done something wrong, but now we call ourselves something wrong. I believe that today Jesus is drawing a line in the sand and he's saying, with me is grace. And my grace will, will approve of you and call out your sin. And then my grace on this side of the line will also empower you to live free 
of sin. Because I don't believe that Jesus told her, go leave your life of sin without giving her some empowerment to do so. I believe that just being in his presence shifted some things for her. I believe that in this presence today, God is shifting some things for you. On Friday night, we had a worship encounter night in this room. It was amazing. I don't know how many of you were in the room that, that, that are here today or that were there Friday night, but it was just, it was a pretty radical night of just worship and expression of God's goodness. And, and we pressed in for probably two hours, I think is what it was. And there was just wild things that happened. And uh, it was just a, a beautiful con- a beautiful thing that God was doing and our our heart's intention was just to lift him high and one of the things that that was even prophesied this morning in our pre-service meeting was that we would feel a continuation of Friday night this morning and so far just in both worship sets and just what the what the Lord is doing and what the team the anointing that's on the worship team it just feels very much so like there's just this continuation uh, from Friday night but as we were in this worship night, we, we began to pray for some people and some people that were just feeling a block or feeling like there was just a, um, just a bit of despair, if you will. And I began to pray for a woman and as I was praying for her, I had a word for her and said these things to her, prophesied these things to her and then I asked her this question and the Lord was like, hey, you need to ask her, does she know Jesus as Lord and Savior? And I was like, so do you actually, have you ever called upon Jesus? Have you, have you ever asked him to take over your life? And she says, no. I haven't. I said, well, do you want to? Well, eagerly, like she's shaking her head like, yes, I do. And tears are streaming down her eyes. And, and right there in this moment, like we began to pray uh, and she received Jesus. And, and I just watched Jesus kind of wash something off of her and her just kind of brighten up in this way that she hadn't before. And it was just this incredible night. As, as the night went on, Brody, uh, one of our home church pastors, uh, he had a word. And the word that he had for the room was that, uh, that, that there had been this season of wandering. And what the Lord was saying is there is becoming this, uh, th- there's no more nomads, meaning the season of wandering is over. And so we opened it up once again for salvation and multiple people raised their hands just to receive the Lord for the first time. And it was this in- incredible, miraculous thing that God was actually, did you know that that is a miracle? Like, I think sometimes we get so interested in like seeing like a, a broken bone healed or a, a leg grow out or somebody's ears being opened up or their eyes that were blind being opened. But did you know that for your spirit to be, for your spirit to be reborn is actually the greatest miracle that could ever happen to you? And so miracle after miracle started unfolding on Friday night and it was just, it was incredible. As I think about what happened that night and as I think about lines of demarcation, there's a phrase that rolls around in my head and it is this. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom it is that you will serve. As we go forward, I, I kind of want to stay in this vein of, of, of no more nomads, if you will, the, the season of, of the wilderness and wandering in that wilderness being over. And, and I would just ask you to set this question before yourself. Do I know Jesus as my Lord and my personal Savior? Have I chosen him on this day and will I serve him? So I'm gonna pray and then I wanna dive further into the rest of this topic. So Father, I thank you uh, for everything that you're doing and and the way in which you you, you beautifully love. It's such a delight to see how you uh, uniquely and personally fall upon each person, uh, different people, all at the same time. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And so I just ask God that as we continue in this, in this service, uh, that you would, bless, you would bless us in ways like opening our ears to hear your voice, opening our eyes to see you in the scriptures. I pray that you would uh, speak to me and through me, God. I pray, Father, that, that you would transform us not further into what you, Jesus, died for us to live. And so we thank you for these things. We pray them in the mighty name of Jesus. If you agree, give me a good amen. 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 Uh, I'm not gonna rehash my entire salvation story, but I got saved at the age of 21. It was April 23rd, 2005. And it was an incredible moment. I'll never forget that day. Uh, I, I, after I got saved, I spent the next few months, if you will, trying to navigate this new life. 
I, ha- I wasn't raised in church. I didn't have a grid for God. It was all brand new to me. And so uh, just to be really, really honest with you, I didn't do a very good job sometimes of navigating my new, my new relationship with Jesus. There were days that I feel like I was hitting the mark, and there were other days that I feel like I was failing and falling further into certain things that I had ever fallen into before. Uh, it was like I was living good for five days of the week, and then two days a week I was crashing. And it was just this repetitive cycle. And uh, in August of 2005, I was invited uh, by some friends to go uh, to the river for one of our friend's 21st birthday. And I'd known this guy since I was probably uh, 10 years old or so. We had been running together for a very long time. And I think that was one of my challenges in navigating the season. I was talking to a gentleman uh, between services and he was just talking about the season that he's coming out of uh, is a new season, uh, a season where he's walking away from some drug problems and some alcohol problems into a new one. And he's like, I just, I'm having a hard time. And I was like, man, you're gonna have to live in an incubator. Anything and everything that comes into your presence, it either is there to help you or to harm you. And you've got to run from anything or silence anything that will harm you. And that was this kind of this season that I was living in. One of the things that I kept finding myself in and navigating was how do the people that I used to run with for so long, how do they fit into this new me? How do they fit into my new life? How do they fit into where I want to go and what I feel like Jesus is trying to do? And that was the, that was the space I feel like that I failed in the most. And so in August of 2005, I went on this river trip for this birthday, and and I'm not going to go deep into details, but basically, I I drank entirely too much, and and long before Jesus, I mean, in high school, all of those things, like, that was not a, that was not a, uh, it's nothing new. Alcohol was just an everyday part of life for me. Uh, in high school and in, and, and in the college. And so uh, I was trying to shift some things and I, I'd had way too much to drink on the river this day. And uh, so later that night, it just continued and it was just getting worse and worse. And so finally, uh, probably to, for the sake of all of the people, I passed out. And when I passed out, they, they allowed me to just lay wherever I laid on the ground. And uh, I woke up about 2.30 a.m., and I, I had been throwing up all over myself, and I'm trying not to be nasty, but I, I want you to understand like the gravity of the situation. Definitely not glorifying the way that I was living. But I, I, I had, had been getting sick, and I didn't know it, but when I woke up, I was 100% sober. Sitting out there by the river, in the dark, completely by myself, couldn't see my own hand in front of me. And I was 100% sober, and the only thing that I could feel was the same thing that I felt on April 23rd of 2005 when I first met Jesus. I was sitting there clothed in my right mind, surrounded by the love of God, surrounded by his presence. It was this radical moment of of the Lord drawing a line in the sand for me. Basically to say, I'm actually the one that pulled you out of this sleep. You could have actually just choked to death. But I'm actually, I'm raising you out of this place and I'm drawing a line in the sand of demarcation. Today, which one are you going to choose? This or me? That or life? And it was in this moment that I just, I, res- I just didn't know what else to do except for to respond to him. And, and, and God sh- began to really shift everything uh, after that. I, I remember, I, I had to kind of forcefully, I was reminded forcefully of this night in particular, simply because for the next three months, because I had done so much damage to my body and to my throat and my esophagus uh, by being sick, I couldn't swallow anything larger than a dime for three months because I had done so much damage. And it was like, okay, all of that to say, how could I not choose the God that woke me up? My question to you is, how can you not choose the God that's waking you up? Or maybe how can you not choose the God that's woke you up a hundred times? Because I guarantee you, we could all sit in this this service and for the next five months, one by one by one, we could share stories and we would just share continuously about all of the times that God actually stepped in and saved us. And then who knows how many times we actually didn't see his hand at work. God is for you, he's not against you, amen? Ephesians chapter four, I mean, Ephesians chapter one, verse uh, four through five, it says this. It says, even before he made the world, God loved you. Think about that for a second. Even before God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us 
to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Sending Jesus to the cross to die in the way in which Jesus died as the son of God gave God much pleasure because he saw you before he formed the world. That should do something to the inside of us. That should cause me to want to step onto this side of the line and actually live here. Not flirt with something that can't satisfy even though sometimes we do, but I believe that God is trying to draw us into this place of falling in love with him on another, another side of this line. I love it. Uh, I wanna go into Matthew chapter seven. There's some interesting things about Matthew chapter seven and that I believe that, that we can pull out of, uh, out of this, this topic of lines of demarcation. But in Matthew chapter seven, there's laid out uh, two different destinations, two different ways, two different trees, two different confessions, and two different foundations. All of which I would say is a line of demarcation where Jesus is saying it's this or it's that. Choose this day whom you will be and whom you will serve. So Matthew chapter 7, 13. I'm going to start there. We're going to go all the way into 29. But it says this. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Pretty incredible. So you have two different destinations. You have a destination that is destruction. In the Greek, this word destruction means to be cut off. It means to be completely severed from that which could be or should be. So to be completely cut off from the life that Jesus actually died for you to live. The other destination is life, and this is uh, the word zoe. And zoe life is just life that is sustained by God not by you. How many of you would like to have relationship and life with God that is sustained by him and not sustained by our own doing? That's what he's saying. There is, there is destruction and then there is Zoe life. This life is both physical, it's present, and it's also spiritual, it's eternal. But it is life that I am actually going to sustain for you as you choose one of two gates. You have the wide gate that is broad in its way, meaning it's easily traveled. There's not a lot of resistance on the, on the wide path. That's why so many people find themselves in it. It's the, subtle, it's the subtle thing that slowly but surely we didn't realize that we've arrived at a place that looks like our life is falling apart over and over and over and over and over again. It's because that, that, that gate is wide and that path is really broad. It's easy to go down. But it leads to a cutting off of this God-sustained life, is what he's saying. Small is the gate and narrow is the, wor- the road that leads to the Zoe life, and only a few find it. Another word that could be used here for small is the word compressed. Compressed is the gate. Think about, think about the narrowness and the, com- the, the word even compressed. I was thinking about, um, you know those large Ziploc bags that are like garment bags? and they're vacuum sealed. It's like, how can something so large become so small? Well, when it's compressed, all of the air is squeezed out of it. And I would say this about this narrow, this small, this small gate, this compressed gate, it's going to squeeze some things out of you that need to be squeezed out of you. Following Jesus isn't going to be simple, but it's going to be worth it. There's gonna be some things that that happen when you start going through this narrow, this small gate where all of a sudden your thinking is getting compressed. The way that you thought things were or the way that you believe things uh, should be, it's starting to get squeezed in a new way. God is squeezing impurity out of us. He is causing fire to burn away anything and everything that doesn't need to be attached to us. The word says that he prunes the the branches that that don't bear fruit, but even the branches that do bear fruit, he prunes those too. Why? Because there's this pressing that happens in this narrow way, in this narrow gate, but it leads to God's sustained life. I love this. Narrow leads to life, wide to destruction. He goes on to say this in verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. 
Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So there's two trees. Once again, this one or that one. There's a good tree, there's a bad tree. Both trees produce fruit after their own kind. But he says a a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit and a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. They produce after their own kind. He's talking about us in this moment. He's saying we are one or the, the other. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse three, Jesus calls those that he redeemed oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Meaning that the ones that he redeemed, the ones that actually would would, uh, recognize the fact that Jesus has thrown us lifeline after lifeline after lifeline, I'm doing my best to redeem you. When we finally say, you know what, I'm actually going to lay hold of that one. I'm going to let you drag me ashore. I'm actually going to let you save me and set me free. He's saying from that moment forward, I'm calling you an oak of righteousness, a tree that stands, that is in right standing with the Father. You're designed now to bear fruit that looks like the splendor of God that actually glorifies God in everything that you do. To display his majesty, to display his splendor. A line is drawn as it pertains to these two, these, these two trees and the types of fruits that they produce. Our fruit determines what kind of tree we are. Fruit can be defined as deeds. It's like, well, what, what is fruit? the thing that you do when no one's watching. That's fruit. Eh, it doesn't taste as good as I thought it was going to. Fruit can be de- defined as actions. When that person cuts you off in the road. Mm-mm. Should not have done that to me. <laughs> Say when. <laughs> Fruit is cutting out that joke that you had about Oklahoma Sooners in your message. <laughs> Bragging on my own fruit right now. But fruit, fruit is the result of one's living. And so we're either one or the other. My question is, will you allow Jesus to transform you into oaks of righteousness? He goes on in verse 21. This is two confessions. No one says to me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And I would say this, although we read one confession, Lord, Lord, there actually were two made. One was made with lips only. The other is made with lips and a heart that says you can now tell me what to do because I'm fully surrendered to you. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, look, I'm doing all of the things. He's saying, no, there's no intimate connection. You're not actually even surrendered to my word. You just wanna do all of the shiny things. What about this thing that I wanna talk to you about behind closed doors that, that no one knows that's going on in your life? Where is your heart there? You're praising me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. It says that in actually Isaiah 29 verse 13. He says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts, they're far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. Talking about there are two different types of confession. There is the one with the lips, and then there's this one where your heart is actually so full of love for God that what comes out of your mouth is an overflow of the love that you have for Jesus. One is lips lip service, and he's not looking for lip service, he's looking for lips that reflect obedience that comes from your heart. This is what he deserves, it's what he's after. He goes on in verse 24. This is the the two foundations. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams arose.
is that of him or her who hears the words and then they do the word, who hears a message like this and says, okay, Lord, where do I find myself on the line? Whom do I serve? What is my fruit like? They start actually allowing the word to excavate some things in their heart that maybe should be excavated. They're the ones that actually hear the word and say, I'm going to submit to doing that, and then I'm going to allow you to work everything out for, uh, out for me. Those, he says, they build their house on, on the rock. The others he calls foolish. Like, I don't like to be called foolish by Jesus. Doesn't, stings a little different than when my wife calls me that. Just kidding, she doesn't, she doesn't say that. She's way nicer than that. She uses good words. It's Mother's Day, I have to like, you know, gotta prop some things up. It's coming, it's coming. Isaiah 24, 26 verse four. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal, meaning, or the rock of ages. Maybe that's how you've heard it said. If you trust Jesus with your life, he will forever be the foundation that never, ever lets you down. Ever. Ever, ever. We, we heard Lizzie share a story that I hope no one ever has to share. But the reason that she could even say the things that she said is because there's a rock that is eternal and his name is Jesus and he never ever actually lets anyone down. And that is their testimony and that is their story. And thank God that they have the strength and the wherewithal and the wisdom to say he's still good because he actually really is. If you trust Jesus with your whole life, he will never, he, he will never be the foundation that forsakes you. I'm not saying that there won't be troubles. I'm saying that the troubles won't shipwreck you like they maybe have in the past. So I'm gonna close this out with a, a story in Joshua chapter 24. And as I read this story, what I want you to do is I want you to place yourself in this, in this story. I want you to place yourself in hearing what God has done for these people. Because like we said a while ago, we could spend so much time going around the room telling stories of God's grace and his hand that they're protected in his mercy. But he's going to recap some things in this scripture, this set of scriptures that I, I want us to actually just find ourselves in the middle of. It's really incredible. And there's something that he says multiple times in here that, that we're, gonna, we're gonna close out on. And I, I believe that it's a really powerful thought. But he says this in Joshua chapter 24. Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and he brought the sea over them and covered them. So he's talking about when he split the Red Sea, the people of God went through it, and then the enemy was captured, was, was consumed by the sea once again. He said, you saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived east of the Jordan, they fought against you, but I gave them into your hand. I destroyed them before you, and, took and you took possession of that land. When Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent Balaam, the son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. He's talking about how he stepped in and interceded for these people. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, the Perserites, the Canaanites, and the Hyatites, the Girgashites, the Hyavites, and the Jubasites. Man, I'm glad we're not called that anymore. But I gave them into your hands. 
I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword or with your bow. So I gave you a land of which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from the vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. You're walking in blessing that you had nothing to do with. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors that were worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. No, it's not just a, a sign that sold at Hobby Lobby. It's actually a scripture. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered in verse 16, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us out and our parents out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. They're saying, you're drawing a line, Joshua, and we can't forsake God. We're actually going on this. We're going this direction. We're going to serve the Lord, they're remembering all of these times that he stood for them. They're remembering the moments when they were on the side of a river and they should have died in their sleep, but they woke up in their sound mind sober. That's what they're saying. That's what I'm saying. I remember, Lord. It says that he protected us our entire journey among all the nations throughout which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, include the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God and he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end to you after he has been good to you. So he's drawing, Joshua's drawing this line, like, are you sure this is the direction that you want to go? No, he said, uh, they say, um, but the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they said. Now then, said Joshua, throw away your foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. I feel like that's what the Lord is saying this morning in this. Throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them the decrees and the laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law. And then God took a large stone. I mean, then, then he took a large stone and set it up under an oak tree near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all of the words that the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua would dismiss the people, each to their own inheritance. Like the people here in Joshua chapter 24, God has made way after way after way after way after way for you and I to live in the abundance that he provides, a Zoe life, life sustained by him. Multiple times, Joshua said this thing to them, throw away the gods of your ancestors, the ones that they worshiped on the other side of the river, meaning while they were in bondage. Just because they, didn't, they did it doesn't mean that you have to. That night at the river that I told, in the story that I told you about, when I woke up and realized that I was 100% sober and realized what God had done for me, that was the last day 
for a lot of things. My language changed instantly. I didn't have a drop of alcohol for seven years, instantly. The bondage that I was in to alcohol completely was broken off of my life in a moment's time. I started walking out of relationship with a lot of things and further into relationship with the main thing, which is Jesus. The Lord drew a line of demarcation and I crossed over it. Joshua drew a line for these people and they chose to cross over it. I believe that today God is drawing a line and the question is, will you cross over it? Will you actually give up the worship to the wrong thing and actually start giving your heart and worship to the right thing? Will you allow yourself to, to step out of this relationship that you have with worry and into this relationship with a God who is a provider? Would you allow yourself to actually finally once and for all, maybe for the first time ever, break off this, this belief system that there isn't really a God and walk into one who is offering you everlasting life? I believe that God is asking this question, choose this day in whom you'll serve. And for some of you, this is going to be the, a day that you'll remember, like I remember the date of April 23rd, 2005. So I'm just gonna ask really, uh, in a really bold way, um, if, if you feel like the Lord is speaking to you and there's a line in the sand for you, and it's time, you're feeling like it's time for you to step out of some relationship with some gods that your family has served for a long time, or maybe you need to walk into relationship with Jesus with more than your lips, but with your heart also, I'm just gonna ask you just really boldly just to stand up. Love it. This is awesome. We're just gonna allow for this to happen. There's no shame in this moment at all. This is beautiful. Anybody else wanna jump in? Would you just, um, let's just pray for a moment. Father, I thank you for what's happening. I thank you that you're drawing the hearts of men and women to yourself. The scriptures say in Matthew chapter six that, that you know the things that we need before we even ask. Thank you that you are personal God to every single person that's in this room, but especially in this moment to these ones that are standing. There are things that they're thinking about right now that no one else might not be, no one else could, would be thinking. And you're speaking to it, you're ministering to it. If you're standing, I would, I would just ask you, just out of your own mouth, if you're standing for the purpose of stepping out of relationship with the wrong quote unquote gods of fear, anxiety, whatever that is, I would ask you to actually out of your own mouth, submit that to God. It could sound something like, Father, right now in this moment, I'm choosing to step out of relationship with worry and into relationship with you, Jesus, as my provider. It could sound as simple as that. I'm just gonna give you a couple of moments, but I would like for you to say something out of your own mouth in this moment. Just 
break the agreement that you have with whatever wrong God it is that maybe you're standing for. God, I give you my, I, I give you anxiety. I won't worship it any longer. Maybe it's the belief that you're always going to be alone. That you're designed to be alone. And that you're not lovable. If you're not standing for that, I would encourage you to stand for that one. Because I believe the Lord wants to break that. Thanks, Jesus. Hallelujah. Is good. Thanks, Jesus. Let's just go ahead and, as a church family, let's just go ahead and pray this as well and just walk into uh, declaration and relationship with Jesus. Would you just say this? Say, Father God, thank you for setting me free from bondage and slavery to the wrong God. Right now, God, I choose you because you chose me. Thank you for loving me. Right now, I choose to cross the line over into relationship with you. Jesus, I call upon you as my Lord and Savior. I confess you, Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead, that on this day, I could have life and a life that is sustained by you. Jesus, I receive new life and new birth. Thank you for setting me free and loving me so dearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching today. If you need prayer or would like more information, please reach out to us on our website at renewlifechurch.com or find us on social media. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to join us in person at one of our two campuses in Midland or Lubbock, Texas. Have a great week and we hope to see you soon.